One thing I've often enjoyed is watching another technician go about troubleshooting a TV just to see how they think. Everybody's got a different technique, I suppose, and, well, I've got my own. I'm going to show you some of the things I might do if a TV were to come in here. Let's say, uh, in this case, let's say the TV came in here and it was dead. Well, the first thing I would do is check the simple things first, like the fuse. If the fuse was good, I might want to see if I've got standby power. Now, TVs are already drawing a certain amount of power even before you turn the power button, and they produce a voltage known as standby power. And that enables the microprocessor, which is on the scalar board here, to tell the power supply to turn on. So when you push the power button switch, which is right here, you'll notice you follow the wire, and the wire doesn't go right to the power supply board. It goes over here to the scalar board, or main board, whatever you want to call it, <clears throat> and it, it tells the, the microprocessor on the main board to turn this guy on. Now, if there is no standby voltage, he's not going to be able to recognize the fact that you push this power button over here. So one, one simple technique I often use to check for standby voltage is I'll take my meter and I'll hold the two probes right across the two terminals going to the power switch. And usually you're going to get um, 5 volts, or in this case it's 3.5 volts on this TV. That at least verifies that I've got standby power. Now if I measure across my power switch here and I've found that I do have standby power, the next thing I'd want to know is when I push the power button, is this power supply getting a pulse telling it to turn on from the main board over here? So what I would do is I could take uh, my oscilloscope and I could touch it to each one of these terminals going to this wiring harness that goes back to the power supply. Now the reason I mention using an oscilloscope here is because a lot of times what what comes from the main board is can be a quick pulse, something that your meter may not have the capability of sampling and holding. Now some meters do have a high sample rate I don't know how fast you need for something like this, but I could uh, just easily put my oscilloscope probe on each one of these terminals while pushing the power button and testing each one of these terminals one at a time. And of course, my other Lee would have to go to a good ground. So those are some of the simple, simple things I would do if uh, I didn't have a schematic. Of course, before you even open the set, it's a good idea to ask the customer certain things about the TV to try to ascertain what the problem might be. For example, you might ask them, did they have any symptoms before the TV started acting up? If they told you, for example, that half the screen was dark, you'd know that there was a problem with the backlight system, either one of the bulbs or perhaps the driving circuitry, one of the transformers went bad. Or that's pretty common. So. Also, you'd want to find out, you know, is the sound working? Things of that nature. Any, anything you can find out from the customer can help you analyze what's wrong. Once I run out of things to do without a schematic, there comes a point where I have to buy a schematic. In fact, I did so on this TV. I often order them from a company called Howard W. Sams. They have these simplified schematics a lot of times. That This one uh, mainly covers the power supply section of this TV. So I, I've often used them and found them extremely helpful. And one section they have in this particular schematic, they've got a section that tells you what the voltages should be on the various connectors coming off the power supply board. For example, if we look right here at this particular connector, which would be right over here. Let me see if I can raise that a little bit. This here is the same as what they show here. That's basically... Uh, this is one going to the main board, and if you look, it tells you right here what the, what the power supply voltages should be. So what I need to do now is take out my meter and check each of these voltages and see if any of them are missing. And if they are missing, then I'm going to have to go back to the schematic and try to find out why they're missing. And if you haven't learned to use a schematic, that's one thing that's pretty important in this business. It, it's actually, it can be quite fun at times and other times quite aggravating. But, uh, yeah, a lot of times you'll be missing a voltage. For example, I might be missing a voltage on this transistor here. And I have to figure out why if I it was. And it could be that the transistor went bad, or it could be that perhaps the uh, driving circuitry uh, or the bias, the bias voltage isn't making it to this transistor because something else went bad down the line here. 
So if you can familiarize yourself with lead, uh, reading schematics, it's a great asset. It's a lot easier than just being a part exchanger. I mean, I realize you can get lucky a lot of times. You'll find a bad cap and you change it and it'll work. And that's great. But if you're in the business, uh, most of the time I, I think you're going to want to know a little bit more than just guessing at what parts are bad or just looking for obviously bad parts. I remember the first TV shop I worked in, my boss would often have me just write down what the voltages were across different test points. He might he might pick an integrated circuit or a transistor and he'd say, I want you to write down every voltage you, you get on this. And then you'd get a pretty good idea what the voltages were and then you'd hold it up to your schematic or your, uh, your voltage uh, sheet right here and you'd, you'd compare them and you'd find out if there were anything missing or something could be too high in some cases or it does not always have to be missing it could be too high or it could be too low now the downside of buying a schematic is the cost unfortunately they're pretty spendy in fact this one I just got from Sam's cost me uh, 27 bucks don't get me wrong I'm grateful to have it it's uh, something I can't fix TVs with without a lot of times but you know you do need it, it, even if you don't have a schematic, you should be able to look at a power supply and read it like a book to some degree. For example, I can look at this trans, this um, power supply and I can pretty much tell you how a large portion of it works even without a schematic. And so it is important you familiarize yourself with these switch mode power supplies. I do have a book on it in my info section there if you're interested. And, uh, you know, it's almost like they're, they're thinking circuits nowadays because a lot of times these, these um, power supplies will shut down if there's a problem they'll sense a problem maybe with the inverter board and they'll shut down or they'll, they'll have a problem with some other feedback circuit and these uh, opto isolators that are supposed to sample um, other other circuits and send a signal back to the uh, power supply to turn it off if necessary they need to be checked and you know you should be, like for example just a quick overview of this one here's here's your AC input your fuse here's a couple chokes to kind of clean up the noise on the line goes right to your bridge rectifier. From here we feed our main reservoir capacitor and then this power is switched into your main switching transformer and it's it's switched by this transistor over here and of course your secondaries are going to feed these capacitors over here. You should be able to look at a power supply and pretty much know what's going on on that level even if you don't have a complete understanding of everything here. I know I certainly don't but um, these are these are the easiest parts of the television to fix as far as I'm concerned, the power supplies, and a lot of times I'll limit myself to power supply repair. I, I don't always like to get real involved with the real abstract problems, and even then sometimes I I can only sit in front of one of these TVs so long before I feel like I'm going to go off the deep end. So, Well, I just took a voltage reading of all these terminals right here coming off the power supply and compared it to what the schematic said it was supposed to be, and it looks like I'm missing some voltages. Um, pin number 4 is supposed to be 5.1 volts, I've got 0 0.8. Pin number 5 is supposed to be 4.1, and I've got 0.8. So now I get the pleasure of going over the schematic and trying to figure out why there's a missing voltage. Well, I realize it isn't picking it up real well, but what I'm having to do is it's, it's on the schematic, it's, it shows you, well, it should show you where the 5 volts come from. In this case, this, this one's confusing. Um, I have to look this over and see the, the source of the 5 volts and find out why it's not coming out of that terminal. There could be a bad component here. This is the P108H you see. This is just showing you a particular connector on the board. For example, if you look at the board itself, this would be the, uh, what is it? Oh, P1089. Not that you know what that means, but anyway. And this, this these are the voltage readings I should have had. I always write a little chart, should be versus was, so this shows me what my voltages are and what they should have been. As you can see, I'm missing a voltage on pin 4, pin 5, those are ground, that one's a little bit low on the ground. Unfortunately, I, I can't seem to find where the, um, where the 5 volt comes off on the schematic, but at least I know what the pins are supposed to be, so I can simply mark which terminals are missing a voltage and trace them back on the circuit board try to find out where they go let's see if I put my magnifying glass there so I'm gonna have to trace these back it's pin uh, 4 and 5 that are missing a voltage so I'll just tra follow the trace and try to find out uh, where the uh, voltage source is supposed to originate from 
Oh, just one quick reminder. Uh, when I took my voltage measurements, I had to find a good ground as a reference. In this case, I'm using a cold ground. You notice it's isolated here. It kind of indicates on the board that everything here is on the hot side, and the cold side would be over here. So I, ju I just soldered a wire on there. I could have put an alligator clip, but I just feel better having a wire so it doesn't move around and touch something. And uh, you also got to be careful with your probe. I'm sure a lot of technicians, including myself, have caused problems that weren't there to begin with just by slipping with the probe. I, I mean, you could easily, when you're checking the different uh, prongs, you can easily go between two uh, terminals and get yourself in trouble.